Today, I'm going to be addressing a very controversial topic and one that, despite whatever side you're on, it does affect real estate and we need to be aware of it. I'm Kathy Fedke and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fedke, the real estate investor's resource. Welcome back to our YouTube channel. If you find this information helpful, please give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button right there. Your support helps us rank and gets our message out to more people. So we really appreciate it. Dr. Howard Botts is chief scientist and executive leader of the science and analytics team for CoreLogic. He's a recognized expert in developing natural hazard risk solutions, and his work has been published extensively. And he's here with us today on The Real Well Show. Howard, welcome. Well, thank you, Kathy. I'm excited to be joining you today. I'm excited to have you here because there's still so much, oh, a backlash towards the concept of climate change. It seems like if there's scientific evidence of something, it would be well accepted. So let's just start there. Uh, why do you think that there is still so much um, denial of uh, climate change? Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, we've gotten wrapped up into different political camps. And, uh, you know, in a lot of places that I uh, uh, talk to groups, climate risk is acceptable. Climate change is unacceptable. But what we do know is, uh, you know, average temperatures have increased steadily since uh, uh, pre-industrial times. And that increase in temperature somewhere... Uh, you know, around 1.2 degrees centigrade or about 2.1 Fahrenheit uh, is real. And I think all of us are feeling it. You can't go a day without hearing something in the news. And so that increased uh, temperature probably uh, or actually being driven by CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's a reality that uh, uh, we're seeing, uh, whether you uh, believe it or not, uh, I think, uh, you know, every day floods, um, you know, heat, uh, uh, tornadoes, uh, hurricane season coming up, all of that uh, enhanced. So uh, I think it's a reality uh, and it certainly is impactful on the real estate community. Uh, and so we don't want people necessarily to hear this and just stay awake at night. I think knowledge is power and uh, helping drive the right decisions and the right uh, remediations to properties uh, can go a long way to saving people money and make good investments. Yeah, I can almost already hear the comments and the negative reviews of me bringing up this topic. And whether or not you agree with the scientific studies that have been done, uh, the, the companies that we rely on in real estate do. And, you know, you and I were just speaking before the show that you got your insurance dropped and you're in, in Southern California uh, and are forced to go on the uh, California fair plan, which you thought maybe covers up to 3 million. I have only heard up to 1 million and most homes are over that. So uh, what do you do? What do you do when you can't get insured? Well, I think, you know, number one thing we're hearing, you know, at CoreLogic, we uh, uh, power about 100 million real estate agents. And over and over again, we've heard across California agents basically uh, telling uh, home buyers, you need to have proof of insurance, uh, you know, before we start down the process, uh, because in many ways, uh, that's harder to secure than financing for, for many, many people. And, uh you know, I think California historically has had uh, relatively lower uh, home insurance rates. Insurance companies suffered huge wildfire losses, uh, uh, which vastly exceeded uh, premiums collected. So we've seen so many companies pull out of the state. And, you know, there are areas certainly that are safe, but uh, any of us that live uh, uh, close to wildfire uh, areas, uh, you know, we're paying the price and insurability is a, a challenging issue. And, you know, some of my neighbors are getting quotes of 80000 a year when they have to go out to the Lloyd's of London market. Obviously, that eventually will get priced into the property and uh, uh, make properties worth less. And, 
uh, overall unaffordable. So uh, it's a, a real, real challenging issue here. And obviously, if you're in a coastal area in uh, the Gulf of Mexico region or the uh, southern Atlantic area, you know, uh, hurricane risk flooding is also making insurance uh, very, very difficult to get. How does that happen if the lender is requiring insurance, which of course they do, but you just can't get it? I guess they just don't do the loan. Yeah, I think there are kind of three parts to that. One is uh, if you don't qualify for traditional homeowner's policy, which in California already excludes flood and earthquake, uh, typically it's the wildfire piece. So the state of California, and depending on where you are in the country, many other states have fair plans, which the goal is to uh, have a uh, insurer of last resort. If you don't qualify for that, uh, uh, you know, the fair plan in California has certainly prohibitions about vegetation, proximity to houses and other kinds of things. Then you end up with forced placement. Uh, you know, your mortgage company will find somebody to uh, insure you, but at a price that uh, may not be uh, uh, anywhere close to affordable for many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, very concerning. Are you seeing that also in Florida? Obviously, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, very definitely uh, citizens insurance in Florida is uh, quickly becoming the number one insurer in the state. And uh, certainly uh, wind risk uh, and others are you know, obviously significant loss drivers there. So what do you think needs to happen at the government level, either in regards to insurance or uh, climate change? Yeah, I think there are uh, a number of significant things that uh, need to occur. Uh, certainly, mitigation, resiliency are two themes we hear over and over again. And I think we see at uh, the federal, state, local level, there's a lot of things that can be done. Uh, you know, not long ago, uh, there were two bipartisan acts passed, the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the uh, Infrastructure Act, both of which have allocated money for resiliency, you know, building uh, seawalls, uh, uh, raising levees, uh, uh, doing a variety of things that will help mitigate, uh, you know, at, at a larger scale. At the community level, uh, you know, there's a lot of things like uh, the FireWise communities in which, uh, you know, you can clear all the brush away from your house, say, in a wildfire risk zone, but if your neighbors aren't, uh, that often uh, will create a, a variety of issues. So uh, I think community, state, federal all have a place to play. But then at the local uh, or individual home level, there's a lot of things uh, individual homeowners can do also to mitigate their risk or to make sure that uh, uh, they're adequately covered uh, uh, for whatever risks are in their particular area. And what are some of those things they can do to mitigate? Obviously, trimming trees, right? And branches that could fall, uh, keeping in California, keeping trees away from the main house, which is a bummer. We just put a, a tree inside our house so that we can have one because we can't have one outside. But yeah, what are some other things people should be doing? Yeah, I think it depends on uh, where you are. Uh, obviously, you and I are California centric and uh, California has now required insurers to uh, offer mitigation credits if they meet uh, about 11 different standards. And one is uh, vegetation removed away from the house, uh, having enclosed eaves, double-paned windows, uh, having a gap between the ground and, and, and your home without vegetation proximate to that, clearing brush out from underneath decks. Uh, you know, uh, And the biggest one of all for wildfire would be most homes don't burn from direct contact from the flames, but from burning embers. And so putting fine mesh screens in air vents uh, into your attic and others, uh, along with making sure you don't have brush in your rain gutters and uh, other things. Uh, if it's a flood area, you know, floods much more challenging, obviously, to deal with. Most people can't afford to elevate their home. <laughs> but about one third of all flood losses occur outside the, uh, the, the flood zone where the mandatory uh, uh, flood purchase uh, areas. 
And so you can get a preferred uh, flood uh, policy, typically if you're outside that zone. And individuals who aren't required can go to their county uh, uh, floodplain manager and find out what the base flood elevation is for their property and get a sense for uh, kind of how risky that is. Uh, year in, year out, hail is the number one draw, uh, loss driver for insurers. So if you're in the uh, uh, Great Plains or uh, other areas subject to severe convective storms, uh, insurers are starting to offer uh, reductions. If you have a hail-proof roof, uh, uh, other kinds of, of things that would harden your home against some of these things. So uh, there are a lot of ways, uh, and I think insurers are increasingly trying to work with homeowners to make it uh, easier for them to uh, uh, make these changes uh, offset with some sort of reduction in, in premium. Yeah, I always tell people if you're not in a flood zone, get flood insurance because it's so much cheaper if you're not in a flood zone because it's considered a lower risk. But um, you know, it can be as low as a hundred dollars a year, but of course, talk to your insurer. It might have gone up since <laughs> since I checked. Yeah, but I think I think that's outstanding advice. And you know, not only are uh, we having issues with uh, you know flooding and loss outside the flood zone, but we know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, with the increase in uh, average temperatures, you know, ten out of the last ten years have been hottest years on record. Uh, the air can hold, uh, you know, right now about 10% more water. So we're seeing significantly uh, 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 larger rain events. Hurricanes, you know, used to be wind damage primarily, but now really two things, storm surge, hurricane push, saltwater inundation. But as you move away from the coast, we're seeing a lot of flash flooding and flash flooding damage. And so I don't think any one of your listeners probably can look at one of their news feeds without seeing some community that seems to have been flooded recently. Uh, and so yeah. I worry more about flooding, Kathy, than really any other loss driver. Uh, and that's only going to increase over time. It's really strange to me how many people are moving to Miami. I love Miami. I would never own property there. Uh, it, it seems like you know, half the East Coast is moving to Miami. <laughs> a lot of people from New York City who uh, politically you would think would be more along the lines of the climate change believers. Th that's just been confusing to me. Why would they be moving to a city that, you know, <laughs> it's right there in the midst of the storms? Well, uh, that's, <laughs> you know, there's this uh, uh, talk about uh, sea level rise as a matter of uh, not if but when. And you're right, Miami Beach is sort of ground zero for nuisance flooding, king high tides, uh, other kinds of things often make the streets look like Venice, Italy, which is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, we know that sea level is continuing to, to rise and will rise. So uh, uh, a lot of coastal areas uh, throughout Florida and Miami Beach, like you said, is no exception to that. And so we're already seeing that impact uh, property pricing and time on market. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, in many areas uh, in Florida in particular, but a lot of places uh, in the Gulf and Atlantic coast, you know, uh, houses are spending 20, 30 percent longer on the market and selling for five uh, percent or lower than what they would have normally. So, uh, people are pricing, uh, I think, sea level rise into decisions, making alternative kind of decisions as to where they want to locate. And so sea level rise is a huge deal. Uh, just south of where I am here in uh, uh, Del Mar, uh, California, they've decided they're going to have managed retreat from the coast. They've told some property owners they're going to do nothing to protect those properties. And some of these are $20 million plus properties that they're going to, as sea level rises, uh, those are going to be casualties uh, to, to sea level rise. So 42% you know, wow. of all people in the U.S. live in a coastal county or coastal adjacent. So you know, sea level rise will be a big risk. And I guess it's the excitement uh, of moving to Miami Beach uh, with a sense that, well, climate change is slow. So uh, 
you know, I won't really have to worry about it generationally, but. Uh, uh, well, let's talk about that. What, what kind of timelines are we looking at? I mean, I, in Florida in particular, because we are bullish on Florida as an investment, but really more inland. So our areas like Ocala and Orlando and inland from Jacksonville and Tampa, are those better bets for the rising sea, sea level? Absolutely. Uh, we're just finishing a study uh, that uh, basically the uh, title, working title is Anywhere in Florida Safe. <laughs> Okay, and I, think, I like that. <laughs> and and I think the perception is, uh, you know, that it may not be, but the areas you named are exactly the zip code areas that we're seeing uh, will have very little impact from climate change. Uh, yeah, Ocala and that whole area, Orlando, the villages, all of those show not a significant change over the next 30 years in risk. Uh, there are even some zip codes in the Tampa Bay area, a little bit inland, that show uh, the that they have very little risk uh, uh, over the next 30 to 50 years. Once you get kind of south of Tampa and Orlando, that changes. Uh, and as you get to Key West uh, and you know further south, those areas obviously uh, are not very high above average sea level, so so they're less safe. So you're right, I think. People uh, that are looking for uh, the winter warmth and, uh, you know, investment opportunities. Uh, there are a lot of areas that are, are, are safe, but uh, buying a, a thing on a coastal barrier island, buying a home or a business, probably not so much. <laughs> and the, the billionaires are still doing it, are the multimillionaires. But, you know, we tell our investors, just don't buy uh, beachfront in Florida at, unless, you know, you're willing to take that risk. Um, you also have so much higher insurance, so much higher. We we just bought a duplex in a bit inland on the Palm Coast, and insurance is actually really low on that. It's a new build, uh, must be built to different uh, hurricane standards and older buildings because we really aren't seeing the impact on that. Um, so, what what are you seeing? Do our insurance companies a little bit more uh, forgiving with newer properties? Yeah, I think. Uh you know, I, I keep talking about studies we do, but give you another example. We work with the Institute for Building and Home Safety, and they're an uh, uh, insurance-funded uh, uh, institute which, you know, sets homes on fire, shoots hail at them, uh, looks at wind damage, all of those kinds of things to understand the structural vulnerability uh, and, uh, you know, what it takes to harden homes. And what we found was any home built after 2008 with the latest building codes in Florida, Louisiana, Texas, uh, has 50% or greater, uh, uh, or say 50 or greater less losses uh, than those built pre-2008. So the building codes that require, you know, uh, uh, home roofs uh, to be braced to the structure, uh, all of that. They, they stand uh, very, very well against hurricane winds. And, uh, and so insurance companies recognize that. And, you know, if you look at virtually every hurricane that we've seen in the last number of years, it's flooding and it's, uh, you know, not wind damage, at least to the newer structures that uh, are, are causing the problem. So uh, absolutely, uh, you know, insurers are very sensitive to individual uh, uh, circumstances. And, you know, you can look uh, on a single block face and have homes that have slightly different elevation, slightly different uh, building codes in effect. And so they can be uh, quite different in terms of structural vulnerability and loss. So uh, a long way of saying, yes, the evidence shows exactly what you said. There, <laughs> insurers do look at that and there is, uh, you know, a, uh, I think lower costs because they perceive much less, uh, you know, potential losses. What parts of the country, and I guess I should say the world, but let's start with the country. Are you less concerned about climate change of some form, either flooding or fires or earthquakes or <laughs> hail? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you were looking for where are, are, are the safest areas, yes. uh, uh, you know, we, could start to point at cities that uh, 
you know, we may not think of as being, uh, you know, all that exciting these days. Uh, you know, uh, it, Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Chicago, uh, all of those older industrial cities, uh, because they're on the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes, uh, you know, have a moderating uh, impact on temperature, uh, make them much safer. Uh, so, you know, throughout the upper Midwest, uh, you know, those areas certainly aren't going to experience the same level of heat or or flooding or uh, uh, some of the other things uh, that we might see. Uh, so longer term, uh, you know, I don't know if there's going to be a rush to Detroit because people want to get in uh, uh, pre-climate change. But, uh, you know, I think those will be areas. There are places in uh, Wyoming, Montana, others along kind of the Canadian border uh, that'll fare well, but even some areas uh, in New Mexico uh, and other places. So depending on what your time horizon is, if you're looking out 30 years, there are a lot of places. If you're looking, uh, well, my investment in 2100, uh, that starts to narrow down. So <laughs> Okay. You know, and, uh, where you are, uh, you know, except for wildfire, uh, you know, uh, being on the Pacific Ocean uh, is a huge advantage where, you know, the Pacific tends to be very cool and uh, areas nearby will continue to be that way. Well, it's yeah. June and I have a jacket on because it has been foggy for a month. <laughs> I just got back from Texas where it was 105 degrees. And uh, when I got here, I had to put my sweats and slippers on again because it's just been cold. So it's a, it's interesting here, uh, but that's one of the reasons I'll probably never leave because I I do like the cooler weather and I some for some reason I like the cooler ocean. Yeah, well, you are pointing. Uh, I was just in Texas myself, and it was ninety six, ninety eight in Dallas, and you know heat is one of the things that uh, a lot of people are paying attention to the, the heat risk in particular. And so you get places, you know, the opposite of what you were talking about uh, in terms of safety. You know, Phoenix, I think, is the poster child for certainly heat. I think they had uh, a significant number of days over 110 degrees uh, uh, last summer. Uh, about 99% of the city is air conditioning. But what happens if that air conditioning uh, uh, fails uh, from power grid or other kinds of things? You know, they estimate about uh, half the city, about 800,000 people could be impacted by heat-related uh, issues. Uh, Houston, uh, they just had that big power outage from that massive uh, derecho or straight-line winds. Uh, fortunately, it was cool when that happened, but, uh, you know, that's another city that relies on air conditioning to deal with heat and humidity. So uh, I was in D.C. recently meeting with a number of kind of senior uh, government officials and their big concern is heat, particularly in low and moderate communities. And, you know, I think we'll see, we talked earlier about what can you do uh, to protect yourself and just the opposite thing we're being told in California, you know, plant trees, create more shade, <laughs> uh, uh, but also uh, obviously insulating homes, uh, double pane windows, uh, you know, a, a variety of things, or even, uh, in our my neighborhood, and uh, it may be the same in yours, people are installing generators uh, to have some level of protection. You know, if the power uh, outages happen, or increasingly, people are looking at using their uh, electric car batteries as a, uh, yeah. a short-term home uh, uh, power situation. So, yeah, as a backup, or just solar. Solar uh, power is really wonderful in these hotter climates. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. uh, I don't mean to scare you, Kathy. Uh, I, I don't want you to stay up no, uh, late at night. But like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I think for you and for your viewers and uh, investors, you know, I think paying a little attention in advance uh, about what are the risks and kind of understanding that and everything from when as we talked about earlier, a home was built uh, to other kinds of remediation. I think it's important. Uh, you know, to make sure that losses don't overwhelm investment. Yeah, where do you get the maps? I mean, I, I saw a map on the, the flood map over the next 30 to 100 years, and that's how I knew that um, not to be 
too worried about Florida, just parts of Florida. Uh, but when you're inland, you know, imagine as more and more people leave the coast, they're going to be moving inland and those the values will go up. Uh, but where do people get the information on that so they can make better decisions? I think there are a variety of ways. Uh, you know, uh, our company, my company, CoreLogic, uh, you know, we're a B2B company. We power the uh, multiple listing services. And so we provide very detailed information about uh, natural hazard risk uh, for properties. But an individual uh, investor or a person interested, uh, there are a lot of public sources. Uh, NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, you know, runs our weather services. They've got uh, extensive uh, uh, information on their website about uh, sea level rise and inundation. I think they're the ones that uh, indicated over a million homes will be inundated in Florida by 2100. And so they show a time series. They also have, uh, uh, you know, FEMA has flood maps that you can take a look at and see where you are relative to the 100-year flood zone. Uh, your local flood pl- uh, floodplain manager, every county has to have one, can talk in great detail about flood risk at uh, any individual property. So there are a, a lot of publicly available sources uh, that you, you can turn to, or if you're working with a uh, real estate agent, they can often help direct you also. Okay, one final question. Uh, you know, I do come from a conservative family, and uh, their concern was that all this talk about climate change was just a way for the government to have more power over people and put in more regulation. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I think whether you believe uh, that it's being driven by human activity or not, we know that the earth is getting warmer uh, and that warmth is having profound effects. You know, the heat we just mentioned, uh, the air holding 10% plus more water. Uh, we see hurricanes moving slower and becoming more uh, rain events. Uh More heat and drought uh, equals greater sort of wildfire risk and intensity. Uh, The jet stream we know is uh, changing direction uh, at times. And in summer, creating heat domes, uh, like we talked about for Phoenix. In winter, uh, we get these bomb cyclones as the jet stream dips to the south, letting Arctic air down. And so uh, we are seeing profound changes in uh, historically, uh, you know, uh, about 15,000 years ago, sea level was 400 feet lower. So things do change historically. Uh, and we're just in a cycle now of increased warmth. Uh, and I think we can certainly, from uh, satellite observations and other things, see increases in CO2, methane, other things, which are creating a greenhouse effect, much like your car gets when you, uh, on a hot summer day and you open the door and you feel the warmth, uh, these gases are holding it in. So, uh, you know, I think individuals that don't believe in climate risk and increased warmth are going to find themselves paying more for properties and, uh, uh, you know, and taking higher levels of risk. So I think the key is understand, you know, where we are now, where we're going to be in 10 uh, 15, uh, you know, 30 years from now. So, uh, I d- again, I don't think you can open a news source and uh, or the evening news and not hear somebody say, I've lived here 30 years and never seen a flood like this or never seen a wildfire like this. So, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, you know, I think we need to arm ourselves with at least what the natural hazard risk is on properties and, and how that's changing. All right. Well, hopefully we find a solution for the insurance issues as well. Uh, Crossing my fingers on that one. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's the political will to do something because there are enough angry Californians at the moment. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's a a frightening thing for all of us that are homeowners uh, in wildfire areas. All right, Howard. Well, thank you so much for being with me here on The Real Wealth Show. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I really enjoyed the questions. 
And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. I was really happy to hear that Cleveland is a top market for avoiding a lot of this climate risk. I had no idea. We have a fantastic team in the Cleveland area that our members at Real Wealth rave about. They get great deals and offer incredible property management. Uh, you can check them out at realwealthshow.com. It's free to join. And when you do, you can just click on the invest tab and you'll get all the information on Cleveland and the team there. We'll have to reconnect with some teams in Detroit too, because that was, that was really fascinating. Detroit and Cleveland were world-class cities at one time and they are on their way back. So it could be a great investment for many reasons. Again, you can get more details on those cities and about other cities too at realwealthshow.com. Thanks for joining me here. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwellshow.com.